For the third presentation for the day, I'd like to introduce John Gross from Central Michigan University, and he's going to give a talk about comparing uh, OrthoMosaic software. So go ahead, John. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm John Gross. I'm a graduate student at Central Michigan University, and I'm going to give you a brief presentation on my research comparing OrthoMosaic softwares for use with ultra-high resolution imagery of a wetland environment. So there's a growing trend in remote sensing to use smaller and smaller resolution imagery to examine patterns and phenomena. And kind of at the forefront of this is the use of UAVs in all, all yeah, unmanned aerial systems. Um, for example, Knopf et al. in 2013 looked at cutover bog restoration in Saxony, Germany. They used a UAS, they flew the imagery, and they were able to ac accurately identify birch encroachment with an accuracy of 84%, which I don't know if you guys read literature, but that's pretty good accuracy for these kinds of studies. And then, I'm sorry if I butcher this, but Ishama et al. in 2012 looked at Phragmites invasions in wetlands in Idaho, and they were actually able to map invasive species with an accuracy of 84% as well. So, I'm sure you've all heard terms like UAS, UAV, and drum, all you know, kind of used in the news. But what do these actually mean? A UAS is a fixed or rotary winged aircraft that's capable of autonomous flight. This can be achieved either through using sophisticated flight control systems with ground control points, or simply by flying in with a remote control. It's not that difficult. Um, however, a UAS is not a fixed thing. They can vary markedly in size and shape and function. For example, you have the Global Hawk, which is about the size of a commercial aircraft, flies in civil airspace, to something like the EB, which is about the size of your forearm. So you do get a lot of variability depending on what you want to use them for. If you want to do it, UAV probably exists that can do it. So why would you want to use a UAV? What are the advantages? The biggest advantage is cost. Typically, you can get a UAV and a sensor for about the same price, maybe a little more, than you could just getting an image from a commercial air vendor. Secondly, significantly higher increased spatial resolutions. Because you don't have to have a pilot, you can fly these things about 300, 400 feet, you get spatial resolutions around one centimeter, which is a lot better than you can get from a satellite. Um, additionally, as you can see, you're able to identify individual plants. That is a pitcher's thistle that we flew imagery over when we had to Wilderness State Park last summer. And you can clearly see it in the imagery that we flew. Also, we are able to deploy these things in the field. That is my advisor and I in the wetland deploying this thing ourselves. That gives the researcher significant control over what you fly, when you fly, and weather permitting how you fly. You know, obviously there's certain things you have to take into consideration with weather, but you have a lot of greater control. Also, it's a rapidly developing technology. You know, every year, better airframes, better sensors, better ways to handle the data. So if it's not what you want now, give it a couple years, it probably will be. That being said, there are some disadvantages. The biggest and the one that the, the rest of my talk is gonna focus on is the pre-processing requirements. How do you take, you know, 100 plus images that the camera captured and turn it into a usable image for data analysis? The second, typically, you have small image footprints. Two to three square miles, depending on the UAV you're using. And third, this is a hot button topic at the federal level. There's significant uncertainty as to who's gonna be able to fly these things, where they're gonna be able to fly them, and how they're gonna be able to fly them moving forward. So, what kind of research did we do? We're working with remotely sensed imagery and the image processing chain. The image processing chain is a five-step system. Imagery is acquired, it's geometrically corrected, radiometrically corrected, you do your training, your analysis, and your validation. All of my research focuses on the first and second step, because without a high geometric fidelity image, the rest of your research is questionable. So I want to look at ways to say, okay, we have all of this data, how can we create something that is usable? So what I looked at 
is a new novel technique called structure from motion. It's a way to take hundreds of images and convert them into a single usable mosaic. So what we did is we compared two softwares that use structure from motion. Pix4D Mapper Professional and Photoscan Professional and one freely available software package known as Microsoft Image Composite Editor or Microsoft Office. Our accuracy assessment was based on four categories. Geometric accuracy, visual quality, ease of use, and cost. So before I talk a little bit more about what we did, just a brief overview of the way it's done with typical air photos. You know, the airplane's flying, it's taking imagery. Every time the image is taken, there's sophisticated sensors on the aircraft that measure its roll, its pitch, its yaw, its viewing angle. There's a high quality GPS. You have all this information available for every image. You can put that in a computer and it can stitch them. But there's a problem. UAS are small. They don't have space to hold these sophisticated sensors. And even if they do have sensors, they're typically not as accurate. The data is just not there to do the traditional methods. So maybe they are in some of the bigger ones, but not on the ones you're going to be taking off the field and deploying. So what does that mean? You know, with a platform that's so unstable, how do you handle this? Well, luckily, there are new algorithms coming out. As I mentioned previously, Structure for Motion is one of the biggest that go through the imagery, use algorithms to identify points in each image, track those points between the images to build relationships. It uses those points to create what's called a dense point cloud. And then from those, it can estimate these parameters that you would typically be using. It can estimate the camera's orientation and viewing angle so you can then overlap your imagery. And as you can see from this picture, you have the same face viewed from three different angles. And it's able to create a point cloud showing that half of the face. So what did we actually do? We collected imagery. We ran it through three different mosaicing softwares, as I mentioned before. We calculated the root mean square error to do a geometric accuracy assessment. We did a visual quality assessment using circular plots, which I'll get to in a minute. And we did a statistical analysis to determine the significance of any differences that we found. <coughs> so our study area was a 15 and a half acre wetland located just outside of Chelsea, Michigan. It's called Brayburn Marsh Preserve, if any of you are familiar with the area. Um, we went through and we did a categorization into four primary categories of marsh, reed canary grass, wet music prairie, and woody vegetation. This was done more for the visual quality assessment to see if there was any sort of correlation between the type of vegetation you fly over and the visual quality of the image that you end up with. So for our geometric accuracy assessment, we had 70 GCP points to start. 53 of those were fed into the softwares to do author rectification. The remaining 17 we used for our accuracy assessment. Just to give you an idea of what these look like, they're about a seven foot aluminum pole with a piece of essentially pool foam stuck on top so you could see them in the imagery after we flew it. And if you look at it in the picture, it's that yellow rectangle. And so from our standpoint, all of our points were based on the geometric center of that foam noodle. And that comes into play a little bit later when we talk about the accuracy of the softwares. So to kind of determine any statistical differences, we did an ANOVA test and two key tests on the individual RMSEs of the 17 points. So when you're looking at visual quality, if you just zoom to full extent in RCAP and you look at these, they both look like they did a pretty good job. Everything's there. But as you zoom in, you start to see some problems. And as you zoom in even more, you can clearly see what we call image artifacts, where somehow in the algorithm, pixels got moved or misaligned, and you end up with pink areas and areas that are supposed to be black. That's one form of visual quality. The other one we looked at, as you can see, is image blur. It's not a very clear image. But how do you actually do a quantitative analysis of visual quality? What we did is we took 100 randomly distributed points throughout the study area using create random points in ArcMap, did a five meter buffer to define the plot, 
and then went through for all three images and just did a visual binary yes-no assessment. Were there artifacts there? Yes. Was there image blur there? Yes. So we ended up with a binary table of data points. And additionally, as I mentioned before, each of these was assigned to one of the four vegetation classes so that we could attempt to see if there was a relationship between the vegetation on the ground and the image quality that we were obtaining. We used chi-square and Fish's exact tests to test for significance between them. So the geometric accuracy. Microsoft ICE was statistically the worst, with 34.7 centimeter accuracy. PIX4D had 7.7 centimeter accuracy, and PhotoScan had 10.9. However, those two values were not found to be statistically significantly different. And it's kind of obvious if you look at it, the red triangles, which are ice, have a significantly wider pattern compared to pick PhotoScan and PIX4D, which are more centered around the origin. Also, you can see the two tests, PIX4D versus PhotoScan, had zero included in its range. So looking at the artifacts in terms of visual quality, ICE did not produce any artifacts. This has to do with the way that ICE handles its mosaicing. I'm not going to get into details with that because it's kind of complicated enough. I don't even fully understand it myself. But they were all statistically significantly different. ICE was the best, PIX4D was second, PhotoScan was third worst. Now, when we looked at trying to compare the differences between the classes, it's obvious, as you can see, they're all pretty much, you know, in the same rough area, there was no statistically significant difference found between classes. So if you look at the image, you're just as likely to find an image artifact in Typha Marsh as you are in Woody Vegetation. We didn't see any significant correlation there. So moving on to image blur. PIX4D had the most image blur with 38 out of the 100 presenting some form of image blur. PhotoScan and Microsoft ICE had 14 and 20, and there was no statistically significant difference between them. When you look at the graphics, it makes sense. They're pretty close together. Now, looking at woody vegetation, we did notice they're not before you're done collecting. If you need to do another flight or need to plan another flight, you can do that right there in the field. However, and this is, I will admit this is a little bit subjective, it's difficult to accurately place the ground control points. It's done with a very small sub-window of the user interface. The zoom isn't very effective, so it's difficult to accurately place the GCPs, which, as I mentioned, I'm trying to hit the geometric center of a little foam noodle. So it's a little difficult to do in its own right, and the software wasn't making it any easier. Also, its user interface is kind of complex. There's a lot of menus. Finding what you want to do is sometimes tricky. Finally, PhotoScan. PhotoScan has a modular setup, so every step is run independently, and you can save them independently. So say you run the first two steps, you get in the third, and you realize, oh no, I've made a mistake. You can load up the second step, fix whatever parameters you need to fix, and rerun it before moving on. Also, Ground control points and images are easily adjustable. You can take things out, add things in, click a button, it incorporates it into the model very, very simply. It's all done in one window. However, because the steps are run independently, you have to be there to start the next one, which kind of limits being able to run it overnight. It does offer a batch processing mode, but that is of debatable use if you don't know what you're doing. It's kind of hard to do that up front. It also has fewer parameters, which again limits its potential to handle dynamic imagery moving forward. So looking at cost, again, ICE is free. It doesn't cost you anything. You can get it on any computer that has a Windows operating system, and you can be running it in about less than a half an hour. Um, just one note, these prices are educational edition the prices for non-educational edition is significantly more. I don't have those numbers on me, but they're more. Um, so PIX4D costs just under $5,000 for a non-commercial license. They do offer the ability to rent the software, 
at a monthly and yearly rate. However, these do not get the same educational discount, which makes me debatable work. And photo scan costs $549, which is reasonable for what it does. So in conclusion, UAVs and UASs are an increasing use in all sectors. You, they're becoming more and more popular, you hear about them more often. And with that, there are an increasing number of ways to handle that kind of data. I've showed you three. There are, non, there are other ones people have developed that we didn't include because we didn't have access to them. But there's ways out there to handle this. However, looking at my, looking at my data, it became apparent that no single software best handles all these criteria. So when you're trying to figure out how you want to process your data, you need to take a step back and look at what is most important in your research. For example, if you don't really care about matching up your locations to the ground, ice might look better because, oops, sorry, ice might look best because its visual quality was the highest. Whereas if you're worried about the geometric accuracy, picks for your photo scan might look better for you. It's also important to note that this research looked at a wetland ecosystem, and these results may or may not transfer equitably to rangelands or farmland or some other area that you may want to fly. And finally, weather is a huge factor. As I mentioned before, wind can play a big, big issue with some of these visual quality issues. So being able to pick a time that you can fly when there is limited to no wind is extremely beneficial. And with that, I'll take any questions. So do you conclude that if you had larger ground control objects, it would be easier and more accurate? Not necessarily, because the larger the object is, the harder it would be to estimate the geometric center. Um, ideally, what I would have liked to do, and we weren't able to do this, we're still in the learning process. We did it for a different flight that I don't have, don't have the data with me for. We had, um, essentially, kitchen tiles that we had painted bright orange, and we marked with a piece of duct tape in the very center. Um, the reason that we ended up going with the method that we did is because if you walk out there, a lot of the vegetation can get up to this high. So you need something that's over the image, that's over all the vegetation, that's still easy to see. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. So you had, a, I'm guessing, considerable overlap in these images. Yeah. Um, and, and the objects being above the ground rather than on the ground. Uh, sort of the cardinal rule of GCP placement is not to have anything above the ground. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I what I was getting at is if if you have lots of overlap in your and you have radial displacement changing and those images are overlapping a lot, so from one image to the next, you're not getting a lot of radial displacement, so that ground control point isn't changing a lot, yeah. but it's enough that it might be causing a lot of that blur that you're looking at. Yeah. So you might you might want to run it without that ground control. Let Pix4D figure out, or whatever the software figure out its own, and see if it's clear. And you might have to go to a different way of ground control, such as mowing little circles or something. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's unfortunate, and I, that is one of the things that I personally wanted to look towards, just because I don't like I don't like the way we did it personally. I think that it was very difficult to work with, and like you were saying, there's error. But for what we had, it was the way sure. we had to do yeah, it. I understand. And it's also partially too for the way that we were setting up other studies that use the same study area and the same data set. We have plots, and each one of those markers was the southeast corner of a plot, so mowing our plot would kind of be problematic. Sure. So it, it was kind of a combination of things that made us go towards that. What method. camera were you using? Well, uh, the camera was a Canon EOS 60. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have sure. included that. Any other questions? You mentioned um, uh, you're looking at those five meter circles to look at the, yeah. the, the cover inside of those. What, how many pixels did you get in a circle that size, roughly? Uh, to be honest, I would have, I'd have to do calculations or bring up our map, and I don't have that. What was your size. pixel size? Let me ask. Uh, the cell size was well, one, 1. 1.26 centimeters. Okay. 
So, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it was, it was a yes or no question. There, it wasn't a question of how many. Right. It was just, is it fair, yes or no? Yeah. All right, great, thanks, Jim. Thank you so much.